So I'd like to welcome Martin Hogg to today's guest presenter. Martin is a Big Venture Challenge award winner and great supporter of Unlimited and our award winners. Martin founded Citizen Coaching CIC back in 2005 when he had a big idea to set up a social venture that enabled people to lead better lives. So he strived to make it easier to access counselling and, and coaching by enabling quick access to services, providing low cost and free services, eliminating jargon, helping people track their own progression and providing easy access to programmes that work. So at the front line, Citizen Coaching trades as Birmingham Counselling Services, and that's a counselling and psychotherapy practice with a choice of 10 trained practitioners who work with people experiencing difficulties and distress in their lives to bring about effective change or enhance their well-being. Citizen Click, a digital marketing service making digital media that little bit easier for businesses and charities through social media training, web design and video production. Anger UK is a package of trained practitioner anger management workshops, weekly classes, online training, DVDs, CDs and books for counsellors looking to expand the range of services offered to clients. And most excitingly, and newly launched this week on the 24th of November, Citizen Home. And that's selling beautiful homeware and gifts all sourced from social entrepreneurs, manufacturers or ethical independents based in the heart of the jewellery quarter in Birmingham. So I think I'll pass. So we've got lots more people joined us now. So I'd like to thank you for joining us and hand you over to Martin. Well, thank you so much for that uh, introduction, Julie, and, and welcome to everybody who's uh, joined us for this uh, blockbuster marketing on a on a shoestring and, and thanks so much for giving up your time and a, a little explanation for the slightly strange uh, uh, venue of where we are today so you can see in the background two very large uh, safes and uh, where we're located with our new uh, project a second location those of you that know us from being in the custard factory in Birmingham we're not moving from there Birmingham counseling service does well and citizen click works from there as well um, but we had the opportunity where we noticed people over this side of town weren't using our counseling center um, because they thought it was too far to walk and walk through the city center so so we, we noticed just from plotting people's postcodes that they're using our um, customer relationship management CRM system that there was a market over here and we've been looking for a space for a long time and the space we found actually had a shop at the front and it used to be a jeweler's so there was a jeweler here for 30 years and it lay in a little derelict and been unoccupied for three years and we know that we could use the back of it for uh, our counseling services and also a meeting room and it's got a lovely big patio for the summer and um, but that left the front part which is the shop which the planning they were very keen to keep it as a shop and not an office so we thought how could we work with people like um, 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 Jericho, uh, reusers, how could we work with Castle Vale, um, Upcycle Project, with Textiles by St Anne's, Beta Pathways, plus a lot of fair trade suppliers and actually bring, uh, bring the shop uh, to the jewellery quarter because there's nothing like it, there's lots of jewellers but there's no gift shops. So part, part of what we've done over the years has been to um, capitalize on retail skills so 80% of our income actually comes from selling goods and services and so marketing on a shoestring is something we've done for uh, for a long a long time in fact as Julie was saying we were established 10 years ago and having that sort of unrestricted income as it were because you're actually earning income from retail by selling goods and services whether it be anger DVDs or websites or um, it, it's really grown our team and it's really hard to imagine that with our counsellor associates our volunteers um, nine full-time staff now that we've actually got 30 people and it's not not something that um, I, I even imagined would happen so um, when the jeweler left here uh, they left these enormous safes and they're so massive that you can't actually shift them so they just become a feature so you're the first people to see live into the uh, vault at the back of citizen home um, where we can't even hide our uh, mugs and uh, social enterprise goodies because we can't get into the safe but we are reassured that there is no gold bars in there either so on with the presentation and, and what i wanted to do today was to to really just show you about how 
you, you don't have to spend a lot of money in order to market your social venue. And we're going to talk about some of the pitfalls that people fall into and talk about some top tips. And a, a big eye opener for me was about 18 months ago when I got a call from the BBC to, and it was at a time when Luis Suarez, the Liverpool footballer at the time, had bit another player on the pitch. Um, and they wanted someone to be uh, come on the breakfast TV up in Manchester over uh, actually over in Salford I must get that right and uh, and uh, Media City and to come on the breakfast sofa in the morning and, and uh, sure enough uh, there it is there's a still I appeared freshly oranged on the breakfast sofa to match in with uh, Bill and Suzanne and, and the background and they whisked me into makeup and uh, applied a lovely orange glow and I had my three and a half minutes of fame and then back into a taxi back to uh, Manchester Piccadilly and I was asking the researcher oh how did you hear about about me uh, as an anger management therapist and uh, they said oh well we googled you and then once we googled you then we looked you up on LinkedIn and we thought well we'll speak to you on the phone and if you have got something to say about this and we like it then we'll, we'll get you there so so that was completely free that 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 three and a half minutes on national tv had come purely from using social media from using linkedin and having a website that when people came looking for anger management we showed up and, and i think this is the problem and particularly it's more complicated as your venture grows and you're tempted to do lots of different things it's very difficult to rank for lots of different things um, on, on one website and here we had a, a website which um, was very focused on the anger management work we did it didn't mention about the websites um, it didn't mention about the social media training it just focused on that so it ranked well in google then this professional LinkedIn profile um, that showed my counselling qualifications and what I'd done. So I, I guess the first tip is go back to that LinkedIn profile and really make sure that your name and your, your headline statement that's at the top of your profile is, is, is quite powerful so that it explains exactly, exactly what you do. So what we did was we, we set up a number of different sites for the different niches. So Citizen Coaching has as the company uh, website has a lot of things on there but Birmingham Counselling Services just talks about counselling it doesn't try and sell websites Citizen Click talks about websites but doesn't try and sell counselling so these become little businesses and as you look at these you don't see the word social enterprise the first thing you'd see is Birmingham and counselling in this case and that's because someone who's actually searching is actually looking for counselling services in Birmingham now as they read on and find we're a social enterprise and they see at the bottom of our website that um, you know, we're, we're the little badge, we're a social enterprise and find out more about it. And, and this ties very much into a sort of unlimited uh, um, strategy about um, making sure that, 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 that things are more, are more, are more mainstream. So, as we go on through this, now this is our latest one. So there's Ian, our, our, our shop manager on the left, with um, Helen Helen Worrell, and Helen is from the Jericho Foundation. And when the, when the shop opened, um, we made sure that we we had some photos, and we got people's permission to actually use the photos, so that we could do a, a, a press release um, of actually somebody actively buying something. And um, so so here, another tip is within your business is make sure you capture all those really really big moments I, I just see social enterprises doing so many wonderful things but you never actually see a, a lot of that in the in the photos so make sure you capture the photos and, 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 and put those photos those magical moments that come up and when you get a group of people together who are supporting you here they are in the in the uh, in, in in the shop then then really sort of make make the most make the most of that so that PR um, that you get and, and the way that we've used the photos whether it be on social media locally or on blogs has been invaluable so I guess what we're talking about here is, is developing something um, called a brand now um, there's a lot of sort of words said about about branding and we might think of big brands like coca-cola and things like that but, but we're looking to be our brand what are we as a social enterprise brand now one of the things I've been campaigning for for years is for social enterprises who are standing on their own two feet is to 
not always make sure that you maintain the quality of what you do. So we'd hate somebody to say, well, you know, we had a buffet from this organization and the sandwiches were a bit dodgy and kind of, we, you know, but do you know what? Bless them, they're a social enterprise. That kind of apologizing for a social enterprise. We want to be up there using our branding so we can stand out there against all the other, the other buffet companies. If you're a buffet company or a cake maker or something, you need to be there and better than all, all the others. Just down the road from us is an absolutely wonderful social enterprise called Miss Macaroon. Uh, and Miss Macaroon make those artisan macaroons to 100 plus Pantone colours and, and, and actually creates jobs and opportunities for, for, for people in the area and training around the absolute absolute um, detail that you need to create that and the Miss Macaroon brand um, is very very powerful and you see these macaroons and you will not find better macaroons then when you find out that behind the project there's all this other stuff going on it makes you love them even more so how can you communicate what your brand is now if let's have a look at some really strong branding. Branding evolved from the days when people had a, a shared field of cattle and they wanted to make it very clear, right, which cattle are yours and which cattle are mine. And so they would use this branding iron. But actually people are branding themselves now. And this picture here was a, um, from uh, an, uh, a marketing agency, Marketing Harley Davidson, which people were so passionate about this brand that they actually had tattoos of the brand. Um, can you imagine that? Can you imagine somebody being so passionate about your social enterprise that they actually get a tattoo of your, of your social enterprise, not just you as the founder. Um, so maybe we don't want to encourage people to be doing that, but imagine if people really believe in, 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 what, in, what, you're, in what you're doing. And the thing about branding is normally, um, particularly with unlimited award winners, the brand initially is around the person. And it's about how you can turn those values that you've set up this business, you're the founder of this social business and what do you stand for why did you set this up and if you can stand by those original values as you go through written on our wall in our office says people are inherently good and if you treat them with um, uh, treat them with empathy uh, you will win in the long run and, and this is something that's been up in our office for a long, a long time. And anybody who joins us as a staff member or volunteer, we always want to start with um, believing uh, the good in people and, and that, uh, uh, that we believe in people. A lot of the people we work with, their truth is probably um, people, um, uh, people are out to get you. Um, watch out. <laughs> so it's a very, very different brand. So your brand could stand for um, your, your belief in people, your values, and you might do some work around articulating what your values are. Maybe putting, putting them on a, on a card or putting them on your website, something to use. And that's something that doesn't cost you money, but it's something that's going to distinguish your project product and your project from everybody else's. So how does a global brand like McDonald's deliver a Big Mac that tastes the same across the world? Think of the logistics. Now, whether you like them or not, the fact that they can make this thing that tastes the same all around the world is pretty much an achievement. And a brand is only as good as its weakest point. So McDonald's needs to deliver the same quality right across the UK, right across Europe, and right, right across America. How can you deliver? And I think if I'm honest with you, the thing I wish I'd learned earlier was about the value of systems, checklists, processes. When you first, when I was first starting up social enterprise, that's not the most exciting thing. The most exciting thing for me was going out, meeting the people, developing the project. So what if there was a little checklist, a way of being able to, to look at where we are? How could you build this brand? And I think I think it comes down into to, to three areas for me, and you can see whether you find these useful too, is what is the niche? How are you going to differentiate yourself? So let's imagine you're a social enterprise cleaner. 
Now, there's some social, uh, social enterprise cleaners in Birmingham. There's, there's one, um, Rising Stars Cleaning, which is a, a fantastic social enterprise who's helped us out here in the shop by clearing out our patio and making sure we look spick and span. And that's a, a social enterprise, Rising Stars CIC, that works with a, a lot of people furthest from the labour market, market, including ex-offenders. And their niche as a cleaning company is that they do hazard cleaning. So not only do they do all the usual commercial cleaning, but they'll particularly go into uh, hazards. They've developed a real niche. Um, so they, they, they get work based on their reputation, but also when people find out that this is the history of them and this is how they employ people, you just get to see that wonderful social value that they create. And the next thing is your brand's got to reflect you and your offer. So it's a combination, whether it be a leaflet or a design, and later on we'll come on to some, some sort of a top list of some of the things I would suggest you, uh, some of the, the starting points really. It's the content, which is what your brand says, it's the words, and then it's the design as well. So all of those things are important. And finally, here we are, we've got this fantastic social enterprise now. It's, it's got a niche, it's got its essence and differentiation. It looks great. Now we need to tell people about it. And there's nothing more powerful than reputation and there's nothing more powerful than positive word of mouth about your brand. And this is where that's free. If you can generate that, so whether it be through your social media, or through your network, through unlimited, through social enterprise newsletters, get the message out, get as many people that have tried and interacted with your brand, get somebody on LinkedIn to give you a recommendation about your services. All of these things count. But what is marketing? We've now got an idea maybe of what our brand looks like and what its values are, but what is marketing? And I think in this day of technology and, and social media, it's very, it's very easy just to dismiss some of the, uh, some of the marketing tips of the, of the past. And this is one that people would still learn in, in universities today. That's one of the most powerful, but I've just kind of updated it for today. So this is the extended marketing mix by Blooms and Bitner. And Let's have a look at a little bit about how this might relate to today. So you've got the seven P's, the price, the promotion, the physical environment, people, the product, the process, and the place. So you've got your seven P's. Let's just bring this bang up to date and, 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 and have a look at it. So I'm going to start with the physical environment. So at about three o'clock on the, on the screen there, we've got the physical environment. And I want you to think about how the physical environment of where your office is or where your, um, where your business is located, um, what your shop or your warehouse looks like, um, how important that is because it's that physical environment. For example, Waterstones. If you were going to Waterstones bookshop, it actually has a feeling like a library. It's very quiet and peaceful there. Um, the books are laid out in a, in a specific structured way and um, it's calm and, and you have a sort of, the staff have a sort of love and passion of books. The physical environment is where books are a precious thing. Now think of Google headquarters with its slides and its um, table tennis tables. So in Birmingham, we've got the Impact Hub, which is a, a place where many uh, startup social enterprises, is. it's got this kind of cool, easily accessible way of getting in that's breaking down the barriers. How different it would be if Impact Hub was in a marble clad office development in the, in the business district, how that might not be engaging with more people. So the physical environment, think about how you can do that, how you can paint it, how you can make it look, um, where you're going to locate yourself. And then you come on to people, and, and, and people are a very, a very important part, but that's where your values come in. And as a social entrepreneur, you're the founder, you're the social entrepreneur, but what about the next person that you employ because there's a whole new world when you've got to everything that you know you somehow got to write it down or, or let other people know about it so that you don't dilute what you do if your venture's ever going to grow then those marketing tips your people are your best marketing when people go out and say well you know 
what's it really like to work for citizen coaching? And if the people go, well, you know, it's kind of just a job for me, then I failed there at being able to get the message out, what we are, because it's that marketing and word of mouth. Think of John Lewis. John Lewis, as a partnership, would be classed by many as a social enterprise. And here we are in Birmingham, we just opened a brand new John Lewis, apparently the biggest outside of London, on top of New Street Station. And the people are delightful. There's times where they've actually, they've spent time in training people. So I took my team right up there, people for the shop here, and said, look, this is where people are spending their pound if they're not spending it with us. I wonder where people are spending their pound if they're not spending it with you. Could you go and visit the competitors, take your team and say, do you know, this is what I look like, this is what I want service to look like. Because if people have never experienced great service, how, how do they even know what it is? So people is really important. Get the right people and, 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 and make sure you train them. And people sometimes say, there's a wonderful adage by a guy called Jim Sullivan. It says, well, what if I train my people and they leave? Well, what if you don't train them and they stay? That's the big problem. So the next thing you've got is your product. So let's have a look and see how products evolve. And there's, there's a little bit of a, a bit of a story here of something to watch out for. The, think about the product as being a gym. So up until probably, I don't know, six years ago, seven years ago, most gyms were, I guess, £40 a month, and they put you into a contract, and the gym would probably open at, I don't know, six in the morning and close at 10 at night, until along came the gym group and Pure Gym, where you've got these, uh, you know, 100 plus locations across the UK, where you've got 24 hour access to a gym, and it's, you know, 14 99 or 12 99 uh, a month, it's open 24 hours, you can come in and use the equipment whenever you want. So how could your product change the way that people do things. So you might actually change your product, but also think about the process that people access your, 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 your product. There used to be a time when, when people used to really fear Amazon. People would say, well, I'm really, now that Amazon is selling everything, we're petrified that we're going to be Amazonized, was a phrase that they used, that somehow Amazon would start doing their product and, and that would be it. Um, now, the real thing that people are fearing, rather than being Amazonized, is being Uberized. So in the process, what is the process of your product? Are you going to sell it online? Are you going to sell this um, process by people just doing all the work themselves, booking it and customizing it and uploading it? Think of Uber. Uber, you can just go on your phone. This is a, an app that you have on your Android or iOS phone. And you want a taxi, you go on there, you press a button, and sure enough, the taxi goes and comes to you. And you can track the taxi. You can even pay with it on your phone. And they've completely cut out the, the way that taxis used to be. And some people around the world are up in arms about this. A lot of black cab drivers are, are up in arms. And, uh, but the whole process now of booking a taxi has changed. Still the same old taxi turns up, but the process has changed. Maybe you could change the process of something. We noticed that we had our anger management courses that sold very well, but there was a whole load of people that just wanted a first step. They just wanted to try out some strategies and probably wanted to try that we were bona fide as well. So we set up a process where we could have an online program, My Anger Coach, where people could come on, pay a small amount of money with a 30 money back guarantee, and people would be able to try out some of the anger management techniques, get to meet us, and if they liked it, then they would maybe buy the full version of the online program or even come on our courses. And that process, that process um, has allowed us to reach more people. And that's when we go into place. So when we're talking about place, where are you going to sell your product? Where are you going to sell it? Are you going to sell it online? Maybe you could sell it as a distributor. So here in our shop, um, we, we've got these goods that from, 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 from local uh, social enterprises. So we have a wholesale relationship with some of those where we'll buy a quantity of those and, and we'll make a margin on some of those. 
So what is the supply chain for that? Are you going to have a physical shop? Is it online? Are you going to work with others? And many social enterprises are service-based businesses. Where are you going to deliver your service? What's the process? What's the product? Who are the people? What's the physical environment going to look like? And then we come on to price. And I think there's a word of caution here. And the word of caution is when things start not going the right way, people immediately reduce the price. The problem you have is if your price is too low, people won't take it seriously, it's cheap and nasty. If your price is too high, some people will think it's reassuringly expensive, but others will just think that yeah, you're being greedy. So when it comes to price, it's about price segmentation. Maybe different people will pay different prices. So, for example, if you want to buy anger management for somebody in your company and that person's going to want that after work on an evening or a weekend, you're going to pay more for that service than somebody that Joe Public that just rings up uh, during the week and wants to come on an anger management course because we've got to raise an invoice, we've got to wait 30 days to, or more to be paid and um, there's more administration involved, the person's having a customised one-to-one service. Um, so. The same anger management might cost different to different people, but then again, different people want different things from it. And finally, let's have a look at promotion. What kind of promotions could work? And you've only got to have a look around uh, um, the UK at the moment, and tomorrow is Black Friday. So tomorrow, so that takes us to what, the 27th. So Friday the 27th of November, Black Friday, where all the shops are going to be having various offers in place and the idea being it kickstarts the, 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 the Christmas shopping time. So promotion wise that's something that's just come to us out of nowhere in the UK over the last two or three years. And um, before that thing that we're going back Halloween we've just had. Halloween never used to be a big deal here in the UK. But how could your product look at these promotions that are already happening? You could ride on the back of Halloween as an option, Christmas, New Year, straight after then we're into the spring, so we're going to be going into Valentine's and Mother's Day. How could you use all the different things in front of you here? How could you change the physical environment? How would the people be different? What might the product be different times of the year? How might the process be different at different times of the year? And how might you bring in other distribution and supply chain as you go around? One of the most impressive supply chains in the summer is ice cream. How when the sun comes out, wow, massive increase in the sales of, of, um, of ice cream. How can they make sure that shops don't run out of ice cream? Yet tomorrow, if it's raining, no one's buying ice cream not be left with so much that it has to all go in the bin. So come back to the good old um, extended marketing mix and apply that to your business. So, so far we've looked at the brand and we've looked at these P's of marketing and this is where people have gone wrong. Now one of the other things I've mentioned there, the cutting edge of marketing really, um, is around rewards cards and Bluetooth beacons. So the rewards card, we've probably seen this for years, haven't we? The, the stamping of the card every time you buy a coffee at your local independent retailer. Uh, just to let you know, on a uh, week Saturday is Independent Saturday. So it's a national campaign to promote small businesses, including social enterprises. And I have to thank Julie for uh, this one because she alerted me to this, knowing that the shop was opening. And we've managed to, to tie into this completely free, where we're riding on the back of a lot of publicity around independent shopping here, here in Birmingham. So anyway, I digress. So the rewards cards, you're getting to see a lot more of these on our phones now. So think about the Starbucks rewards card. How can you get repeat business? How can you get repeat business? Bluetooth beacons are a funny one. Over in America, I was hearing about a shopping mall whereby they've got these things called Bluetooth beacons. And Bluetooth beacons have the ability to send a message to your phone if you have Bluetooth activated. So um, what, they would say, what they would say when they give a receipt out in the shop is, um, next time you're in the area, make sure you've got Bluetooth on because we have special offers. So sure enough, you walk into the shopping center and you, and you see if you can get here quickly, um, you can get a reduction in the price of trainers. So we're starting it at 
60% off and for every second it takes, we're going to count it down. And apparently the, the best somebody wants to do was, I think, mean, 40% off where they got into the shopping centre and ran into the shop and managed to pay for them. So Bluetooth beacons are the kind of cutting edge stuff. So some of these things that are happening in the private sector at the moment, wow, these are things that you would be groundbreaking if you did these in social enterprise. But there's a dilemma here and, and uh, one to just be cautious of. Now, I've kind of mentioned it already. Sometimes it's going to be good to play the social enterprise card up front. And sometimes it's going to be best to mention it second. And I've had personal experience of this. When we actually had a very prominent branding in the early days to say uh, we were an anger management service and we're a social enterprise, we had quite a bit of feedback from customers where they say, well, are you a proper provider of anger management services? Because I actually need a letter for court. Is it going to come on some kind of Mickey Mouse charity paper or, or, or certificate or something like that? So, so just a word of caution. It's about how you phrase it. Having all the, um, having all the um, proper qualifications, having all the... Um, uh, professional looking uh, materials and things like that are really important. Now we should be real out and proud about social enterprise, but I think people need other reasons to buy as well. They need to buy because you have a fantastic product and then when they hear that the people or the products you use are unique, that even helps it even more. And it's activating the right word of mouth. I'm hoping that people, for example, will come into our new shop and go, do you know what? That's an amazing eclectic gift shop just opened. It's got some real weird stuff that we've never seen before. I bought some presents for people. And you know what? Some of it was actually a social enterprise, and they're actually a social enterprise themselves. So if that was the message we could get going, that would be marvellous. And when we have a look on Twitter and things, those are some of the things people are saying. But who are the consumers? And another word of warning if you're a social enterprise is to think, who's actually paying the bill? Now, sometimes we see this with youth services. So you might be selling youth services or youth products, and a lot of people go down a website and materials that engage youth. Now, that's not wrong if you're actually recruiting youth, but actually, if you're selling your products to stakeholders like councils or commissioners, the NHS and um, private companies, they want something that that gives them the, 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 the outcomes. They want something that convinces them that you're a legitimate service because they're the ones paying the bills. So you almost need to take two separate tracks with your message. One message that goes to commissioners and the kind of grown-ups who are paying for it, and the other one that means that when young people find out about it, there's a fantastic opportunity for them and they see that this is a service for them as well. So it's really about understanding your customer. And I would suggest to you there's only two reasons that people um, buy. They're either dealing with pain or moving towards pleasure. So think of any product or service that you've actually bought and think about you're going on a holiday. Well, that's moving towards pleasure. Uh, you bought some headache tablets. Well, that's moving away from pain and maybe moving towards pleasure. Um, Counselling because we're feeling kind of kind of a bit down it's the it's the winter well that's hopefully moving you towards pleasure and away from the pain you're feeling now so those are some of the things to think about so if we can identify the pain or pleasure that your customers feel then we can put together messages that work for it so some of the questions to ask um kind of the age of the person the gender what geographical area Who's paying for the sessions? What's their typical occupation, hobbies and pastimes? Uh, what magazines or books do they read? And what films or television might they watch? All these sort of things. And what a lot of brands do is build uh, an avatar, build a ideal customer and write to that person. So um, long before my social enterprise days, I used to work for Toby Carvery. And uh, yeah, hopefully some of you have had a good Toby Carvery o over the years. Um, I had far too many of them at the time. Um, but anyway, I digress yet again. Um, and what we did when we were, we were looking at the Toby Carvery brand and bringing it up to date, um, so this is going back kind of 14, 15 years ago, we actually had a, an avatar of a typical Toby Carvery customer. And they were uh, David and Jane. 
and they were typically people in their 50s who were looking for a, a, a traditional, quick, freshly prepared meal. And we looked at what their values were and how they, so who's going to be the person who's your ideal customer? What's going to be your unique selling point? What's going to be the thing that makes you stand out from others? And I'm not sure just being a social enterprise is going to cut it here. What's the thing that you're going to do? Are you going to deliver it faster? Are you going to deliver it better? Are you going to deliver it with better ingredients? What's the story about your, about your product? Okay, so time to give me a little break and get you to do some work now. So what I want you to do, I just want you to have a think and just we're gonna, we haven't got any music to play because it's gonna feed back terribly. So we're gonna, uh, gonna ask you the question. So we're gonna go, we're looking here at what's your unique selling point? How are we gonna make, uh, make a difference and stand out? I want you to think about if you were a car, what car would you be? So that's question one. And question two is, if you were a breakfast cereal, what would you be? So I'm just going to give you a few, uh, a few seconds while um, while we we do that. So um, if you were a car, what car would you be? If you were a breakfast cereal, what would you be? Okay. So just think about that. We'll just um, just sort of for 20 seconds or so. Maybe we'll have a little whiz round um, round the shop while that's happening, and then we'll come back um, and uh, ask, answer those questions. So here we go. We're going to walk round. I'm going to say hello, hello to everybody here. Give us a wave. Hello. Give us a wave here. There we go. Shameless promotion. We're going round the store. Here we go. We're coming back, and we're going to ask you the. Uh, Hopefully everybody's still there. Right, so we're going to do the whistle stop tour and we're back. We're back in the room. So have a think about what car, what car would you, would you be? So um, hands up out there if you would be a Beetle or a Mini. Let's have a look. Okay, a few. Um, um, that's not a very nice sign. Thank you. If you could stop doing that. Um, so think about that personality. Think about those cars. We've got a, a Volvo. Uh, a Volvo there, um, so Volvo, think about safety, maybe if you were a counsellor to be a Volvo would be a good solid thing to be, a real unique selling point there. If you were a breakfast cereal, what would you be? Any all brand out there, any all brand or brand flakes, porridge, any porridge out there? Let's have a look. Um, Rice Krispies, has anybody got a bit of snap crackle and pop well if you do you need to make sure that if it's appropriate to your brand that's in your in your website as well and um, maybe you could bring your favorite hobbies or pastimes we're just starting to um look for social enterprises in the area that we can we can bring in and nurture them so they can supply the shop and there's one guy and in his in his spare time he restores furniture and we're thinking wow i mean this is a meticulous thing that he actually does maybe he could be a future a future maybe he could be a future supplier it's something he's doing as a hobby at the moment another question is when people meet you they're always struck by what is it what are people struck by uh, when they first meet you. Maybe it's your humour, or maybe it's your red hair, or uh, maybe it's that you always wear red. What, what, it, what could it be? And again, what's the profile of a typical client? And you can just improve the process, product and service. You only need to be better than the people down the road that are, that are, that are doing it. So there's some things to think about, and that's in about developing your marketing message. And remember, these things are free. So just a few more minutes looking at a marketing message, and then I'm going to give you some, some places to sort of do some homework with, really. So at, at the end of the day, what we've got to do is get the right message, here's my service, in front of the right people, those client avatars, the people that you've used, at the right time, so when they come looking for the product, so we know you're selling Christmas baubles in January, they've probably got a quarter of the worth that they have at the moment, using the right media, the right newspapers um, to get your PR article in, um, the right appearance on social media, etc. So the right message in front of the right people at the right time with the right media. 
Now, I know we're recording this, so if you have missed anything in the slides, I'm sure Julie can let us know uh, about what the rules are, about how we can get it. And I'm quite happy, uh, Ju um, Julie, to let you, you know, let people have a copy of the slides as, uh, as well. So, social media marketing, very, very effective. So, I would go with a Facebook page, um, not the personal page, but the Facebook business page. I would go with LinkedIn personal profile, and then as soon as you have more than one employee, have a LinkedIn business page as well. Um, the things that most people forget is YouTube. So, make sure on YouTube that you have maybe four or five um, or more videos, maximum 30 seconds long. The sort of frequently asked questions that people have about your product is a good place to start. Get involved with Twitter as well. Google Plus, a good way of getting good search engine optimization for your website is to have a Google Plus account. And getting those first steps in social media, the branding consistent, consistent messages, targeting the right followers, engagement, ask questions, give value, give 10 top tips, this sort of stuff. And look at how many followers are you getting, are they the right people, and ultimately is the phone ringing <coughs> as, a, as, a, as a result of it. So these are some of the things that actually work in your, in your social media around Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Pinterest. If, if you like us with the shop, you've got lots of wonderful images. And in the hints and tips, here are some of the things that, that, that we do that are particularly effective. And one of the things, if you, if you do have a physical location, then getting onto that map on Google is going to be absolutely vital. So if you've got a physical location where you deal from, all you need to do is to go to Google Local Business and you sign up with the disclosing your physical location. And when you sign up, this is completely free, Google will send a postcard to that address to check you are who you say you are, and then you enter that code and your listing goes live. Now, if you were a councillor in Birmingham, there's probably 200 councillors on there. But if you were in an area of Birmingham, like Harborne or Edgebaston, when someone goes looking for a councillor in Harborne, then you probably will find that um, you could show up on this map, but only actually if you're, if you're listed. So, Google local business is going to be really important. Other things that are important, your business cards and leaflets and brochures, posters. Um, advertisements less so, unless you've actually got sort of a, a good local parish magazine. Any of you that would love to write a book, then nothing about establishing yourself uh, with credibility is better than writing a book, particularly if you're in the services or in counselling. Um, uh, local employee assistance provision if you're doing a, um, a counselling or wellbeing service. Getting out there and networking. Look on Meetup to see what local networking goes on in your area. What local networking run limited doing? Other social enterprises like Social Enterprise Mentor, what are they doing? How can you get people to give you referrals? Chamber of Commerce can be quite an expensive thing to join, but one sneaky trick is, quite often if they have events, you can ju come just as a non-member for 10 or 12 pounds, and then you can really test it out, and you can get quite a lot of value from that. The library talk is, is my number one favourite tip, because most of what we do is a service, so being able to give people some top tips uh, in a library or community setting, give something back to your community, but also get your message out there. Make sure you attend local events. Make sure that you're on uh, local free directories. See what there is in your area. Hey, and if you do get the chance to be on radio or TV, you'll get a great boost from that as well. Right, so that's our 45 minutes. I can answer any questions that you have about that or anything else. Happy to give you the slides and see the recording. So I can see that there's some people still there. Are you there, Julie? I'm here, Martin. Are you there? <laughs> yes, thank you very much for that. That was a great uh, a session and obviously great tips for marketing on shoestrings. So all these things don't cost anything other than time and, uh, you know, looking and researching. So and I love your whistle stop tour. That just shows how to grab any opportunity that you can that uh, comes in front of you. So that was great. So thank you for showing us around Citizen Home. Uh, I can't wait to uh, visit there. So uh, we're just getting questions come through now. Uh, 
Jessica, she said, thank you, Martin. That was really, really helpful. Uh, I personally loved the uh, breakdown of the marketing mix of seven Ps. Uh, so I thought that was really good uh, to explain that. And just to let everybody know, if Martin, if you can send me the slides, I will send everybody the link to our YouTube channel and a copy of the slides so they can listen again. So, uh, and I really thought that was a great insight because obviously you have experience in both the commercial sector and the third sector so that was a great insight and tips from yourself how you've marketed your social venture as well so if i can ask you a question uh, we've got mark allen and he said what advice can you give to a business trying to sell services in a deprived rural area who maybe can't afford them I mean, I, I think this is this is an in, incredibly big challenge, and and it's often said that um, there are many broken markets, particularly in 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 healthcare, um, where actually the people that would most benefit from a service can't actually afford it. So the people that most would most benefit from chiropody, for example, for their aching feet. Um, they may be on a waiting list to access that from the NHS, but, that, but actually they're, they're least able to be able to afford that service. So it is a real challenge. So you're in a rural setting. Um, so there's a couple of things that spring to mind. I think the first one is, well, if, if the people in your area can't afford to pay for the service, who could pay you to deliver it so that you could offer it for free? So is it a service, so for example, if it was something like counselling, um, some organisation somewhere, uh, whether it be the, um, the IAT, the Improving Access to Psychological Therapies, um, or um, a local charity, somewhere, somebody somewhere is probably delivering that service at the moment. How could you maybe be a subcontractor for them? Um, I'm a big fan of trading, but also you could have a look at um, some grants and, and, and funding that, that, that might come out in that, in that niche. But going back to the trading, what I've always done is this, and I, I used to call it a Robin Hood um, method, but uh, people used to say, okay, well, you're robbing, robbing somebody, but we're never robbing anybody. We would always say, okay, well, if we're going to be delivering the services in the deprived area for free, where is the neighboring affluent area where you could sell the same quality services? And, and that's what we did with our counseling. We have a paid counseling service that generates um, profit, which allows us to deliver the free services. Now, we, if we want to deliver more than that, then we really have to you know, get leverage in some funding because the demand is always very great for it. But I would say, have a look, where is an affluent area where you could sell this service so to make sure that you can pay the bills and look after yourself so you can do it in the, in the more deprived area? Or who else is delivering that service? How could you work with them or become a subcontractor of them? Or how could you uh, get some kind of uh, funding to be able to do it? How's that? That's great. Thank you for that. So I hope that's uh, answered Mark's question. We have a question from Sahil. So, Martin, how would you recommend starting on Twitter when you're in the startup phase? So you don't have a product or service yet, but you are looking to build it. OK, so I think when, when you see somebody's Twitter profile, it's the, you've got the actual name that you choose, your at, so at Citizen Coaching or at uh, Martin, Martin Hogg in, in my case. So you've got your at message. So if you're clear about what you're going to be doing, you could be at, um, now I'm taking my example of chiropody, um, you're going to might struggle with that because you're not going to get at Birmingham chiropody. It's going to be too many, uh, too many letters. But you could be at Beham Happy Feet or something like that. Um, and then in your description that goes with it, you could be very clear that um, um, at Birmingham Chiropody, we improve access to chiropody services um, so that everybody benefits from being able to walk well into old age. I don't know, I've kind of gone down a, an alley with this, haven't I? <laughs> but, but so make it very clear about what you're, you're doing. And you could also use Twitter as a sort of like a survey, really. You could, you could go with 
and budding social entrepreneur seeking your comments on how to set up and as you follow people and they follow you back target people who are using the um, hashtag SoCent S-O-C-E-N-T so if you, if you search for hashtag S-O-C-E-N-T those are people that um, have, have tagged their uh, tweets to um, alert people of social enterprise so they tend to be quite good people to follow you back when you follow them so I would get started by being clear about what I'm going to do or what I'm going to do or if I don't know what I'm going to do um, sort of talk about what, what people's opinions ask the question um, do you think this is a good idea should my logo be red or green should my um, where will I be located? Should it be here or there? And that, that will get the conversation going and you can ask people's, ask people's opinions. Perfect. That's how I'd do it. Thank you. Now a question from Ryan. He said, good talk, thank you. Do you know of any government implemented or sponsor, supported marketing options for this sector? Um, so when it comes to government ones, I'm not too sure. Could be maybe a local authority. There's a couple of places to look. So the first place to look is gov.uk, so that's gov.uk, and that's the official government website. And it's got a lot of information on there that used to be in something called Business Link. So when you go into, um, into there, there's a whole section on um, self-employment and a whole section on small business. And it will even suggest where, where your local authority has grants funding to set up a business. It might mention it in there. But also, I think it's about having a look locally to see what sort of projects there are. So, for example, I know that there's a, a women's enterprise project that um, ISE, Initiative for Social Entrepreneurs, would run in, 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 in Sparkbrook uh, in Birmingham. So, if you were somebody who lived in that area and you were, uh, you were a woman, you'd be able to access lots of, maybe not grants, but um, co-working space, you'd probably be able to access fantastic workshops and, and things like that. So it might be hard to find the money, but you will be able to probably find um, workshops and some help and maybe some uh, mentoring as well. That's great, thank you. If I can just say, I live in North East Lincolnshire and I know there's a, a programme in North Lincolnshire to get people online and there's funding for broadband, so funding for websites, things like that. So as Martin said, just look at your local councils and their business support uh, departments and they may be able to help as well. And just as Martin picked up in his presentation about Small Business Saturday, and that's Saturday the 5th of December, anybody who has a local business, be it a product or a service, you can register and there's an online regist register. So again, that will increase your visibility and that's free to access. So uh, just one more question from Laura. Thank you very much, Martin. Yeah. Uh, if you are offering a service your local council offers, but to a different age group, how do you prove this life skill needs to be delivered earlier rather than later in life when the council then offers the service? And she's also said a bit later, she thinks she'll deliver it in a unique way. <laughs> <laughs> so she thinks I deliver in a unique way. <laughs> <laughs> she, no, she thinks she will deliver this service that she wants to do in a unique way also. <laughs> Oh, I feel really, I feel really excited by that. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I guess that the big challenge here is um, we've got to kind of prove it. We've got to kind of prove that what you're delivering now um, prevents something else happening in the in in the future, and that cause or effect. That's quite hard work. Um, so, at its very simplest. Um, taking a measure of where people are at the beginning of your program and measuring at the end of the program where they are um, gives you uh, a very crude measurement of what impact that you're actually creating. So let's take the example of elderly care. So if we look at elderly care, care and falls, so there's a lot of work being done on, on falls, falls prevention and a lot of that was about um, doing assessments of people's homes and making sure there weren't any trailing wires, making sure um, people when they were changing light bulbs weren't sort of um, 
you know, climbing on top of their furniture and not being able to get down. And so there was a program around uh, growing awareness around falls and actually visiting people's houses, fixing things, educating them, getting them involved in um, local walks and um, befriending sessions. So people were becoming more active and they were getting better on their feet and they were um, meeting up with others at, at a local village hall or whatever. So that was an example of rather than concentrating on how do we get people's falls and fractures to heal better, how can we prevent somebody having a fall in the first place? And, and I guess the only way you'll ever convince people that that's a better way of doing things is to prove that what you do works and then really find out who the commissioner is or, or who the organisation is that's currently delivering the service. Now, you might have to be a little cautious here in case they steal your idea. So anything about intellectual property, I think you need to be uh, wary uh, wary of that. But, but but I have seen this happen. I have seen where people have come up with better ideas um, and they've been able to mainstream the service. And I think that's what someone like Unlimited could maybe help with. If, you, if you're an Unlimited award winner or you're thinking of applying to Unlimited, maybe being able to prove that your um, that your your product, your service actually works, make sure that you allocate some of your time and some of the money to making sure that you you, you prove it. Maybe you could work with a local college, a university probably, work with a local university where a student um, could um, support you in putting together a document that, that proves that, interviewing people. So you actually have a sort of a, a meaty document that tracks the impact of your program and maybe you could convince some people that it'd be worth uh, with any discretion we spend they have in, in trialling it. Brilliant. Thank you. That was a really difficult question and a great answer. Thank you. So I'd like to thank everybody for posting the questions and most of all I'd really like to thank uh, Martin for your time and expertise, brilliant presentation and really good uh, big examples of marketing on a shoestring and thanks for letting us look in your new venture, uh, Citizen Home in Birmingham in the Jewellery Quarter. So uh, everybody pop down in the social enterprise shop. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So thanks, Martin. So I'd like Thank to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I will send the link out with the uh, slides and uh, the link to our YouTube channel over the next few days. So if I can just promote our next webinar, which is uh, next Wednesday, Wednesday the 2nd of December. I can't believe it's December already. And that's Seven Steps to Successful Selling. Uh, Mike Cooney, our guest presenter and founder of Right Track, again, that's based in Birmingham. And he will we'll create an easy to follow seven step guide to successful selling that you can adapt or uh, adopt or adapt to suit your product, market, customers and own personal style. So you can register via our website. So that just leaves me to wish you all a good afternoon. And thanks again, Martin. And goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye bye.